Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas. We'll be bringing the latest in everything cool every single day directly from my basement. Because these days we're all in basements, aren't we? Uh, I wanted to dedicate this rundown to the police and fire departments of cities all over the world. Uh, these are people that are rushing into danger every day, but more so these days. And uh, we are eternally grateful to you and your sacrifices. And I hope that you're all staying safe. Um, and doing the best that you can to take care of your own families and your own lives, but also all of the citizens out there that need your help. Thank you very much. Let's get started with your rundown. We're getting a better idea of what to expect from the new Batman movie. Director Matt Reeves has revealed a few new details about his gothic new DC project, The Batman. Speaking with Nerdist, Reeves says that his version of the masked do-gooder, played by Robert Pattinson, will not yet be fully formed in the movie, with the character still broken and dealing with the trauma of his past. Reeves adds that this doesn't mean the film will be another Batman origin movie, but won't ignore that the character's origins have shaped who he is. When asked about his favorite past Batman movies, Reeves says he's a big fan of Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins. I'm Batman and The Dark Knight, particularly Heath Ledger's take on the Joker. He also likes Michelle Pfeiffer's interpretation of Catwoman. Meow. And Danny DeVito's take on the Penguin in Batman Returns. I am an animal! Those two characters will appear in the new movie, with Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman and Colin Farrell as Penguin, so it will be interesting to see what kind of spin Reeves puts on them. The Batman was in the middle of shooting before production was shut down due to the pandemic, so it might not make its scheduled June 2021 release date. No word on when filming will be back up and running. I cannot wait for this freaking movie, and I don't care if we have to wait a little bit longer longer so that it's exactly what Matt Reeves has in his head. He picked the best three Batman movies, I think, from my estimation. Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, and Batman Returns. I love the original Tim Burton Batman movie as well, but Batman Returns is something really, really incredibly special, and it's because of Michelle Pfeiffer, and I think Danny DeVito was an excellent Penguin, but honestly, Michelle Pfeiffer blew my mind as Catwoman. She was so good, so over the top, so perfect for the role. I am Catwoman. I'm super excited to see what Zoe Kravitz puts together for the new Catwoman. But more than anything, I just want that artistic stamp, you know, that real kind of effort to build something that sort of resonates and not necessarily competes with what's been done in the Batman movie universe before because there have been so many good ones. But honestly, I want this one to just feel like a revitalization, like a re- fresh of what can be done with this character. And I really like that Reeves is, is digging deep into the detective prowess of Batman, which is something I don't think the Batman movies have done an especially great job at. He's always got cool gadgets and he can outsmart people with some of his tech and stuff, but I feel like Batman should be in his head a lot and he should be, you know, using his detective wits a lot more. And technology plays a part in it and certainly the tools that he uses will play a part in it, but I think we really need to see that Batman is the most interesting character on screen. And he's the smartest, and it's his mind that helps him win everything. It's not his, his money, and it's not his uh, physical abilities. All of that stuff comes into play, but it's his mind that makes him the real threat to the bad guys out there. And I really want to see that in the new Batman film. Sony and Microsoft are still promising that their next-gen consoles are going to be out this year, but at least one current-gen system is already feeling the pinch. Nintendo has reportedly halted shipments of new Switch consoles to their home country of Japan. That's according to the Japanese financial news site Nikkei, which claims that Nintendo has forced to suspend shipments for two reasons. Sales have surged during the global pandemic as people stuck inside want to play games, but the pandemic has also disrupted supply chains, meaning Nintendo can't make new units to keep up with the increased demand. The good news is that Europe and North America are still getting new orders, at least for now. Yeah, it's been crazy. I, I periodically check in on some of the... Uh, uh, the the you know electronic retailers out there like Amazon and Best Buy and stuff to see if they have switches in stock and nope they're impossible to get so good on everybody that managed to get one of those Animal Crossing switches those are going to be collector's items forever. I'm really happy that people have been going and, and finding awesome experiences in video games during this time of isolation and being trapped with their family. It's been pretty great to play Animal Crossing, hasn't it, Rue? Yeah, I think there is a, a silver lining 
to this really crazy period that we're in, and that's everybody that has, you know, rediscovered how magical video games can be and how much they offer this opportunity for us to escape our, you know, our, our routines and our regular lives and feel like we are accomplishing some great things and, and experiencing great adventures. That's why video games are the most compelling medium. <laughs> good news is more switches are coming and the other good news is that if people have been able to get switches or whatever other machine they've been able to turn to other devices and so Xbox and PlayStation sales have been going up too and so more and more people are playing which is great for the video game industry and hopefully those people that have sort of come on late or have come back to video games because of the time that they've got right now will stick with this medium and the medium will grow and the games will get bigger and better and we'll have more people making them and that's what I've always wanted. Disneyland is closed right now, but that hasn't stopped audiences from experiencing the best that Disney has to offer from the comfort of their own homes. Disney has announced that their new subscription streaming service, Disney Plus, now has more than 50 million subscribers following its launch in November. That's a pretty good number when you compare it to other streaming services like Hulu at 20 million, but Disney still has a very long way to go before they dethrone the king, Netflix, which has 170 million subscribers worldwide. Disney Plus obviously has the back catalog of Disney titles, but they don't have as much exclusive streaming only content as Netflix. Their biggest show, The Mandalorian, ended its first season in December, so going forward, Disney wants to make sure they keep pumping pumping out enough original content to keep audiences coming back. The Mandalorian Season 2 and several other new Star Wars shows are already on the way, as well as new Marvel shows like Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision. Disney CEO Bob Iger says they're also planning to release more mid-tier movies directly on Disney+, Plus, bypassing traditional theatrical distribution. The first, Artemis Fowl, arrives soon. You're all I have now, Artie. I'm a huge fan of Disney+. Plus. There is, you know, obviously a lot of Star Wars and Marvel and classic Disney stuff and Pixar, but there's also a lot of cool documentaries and National Geographic stuff. There's old animated series. It's been really fun to check. I watched uh, Silver Surfer with my daughter for a little bit, and that was pretty trippy. Watched some classic Spider-Man animated stuff. But I do think the promo for Disney Plus heavily leans on The Mandalorian Season 1. I have those eight episodes on my phone. I watch them all the time. I think that is the most rewatched TV show I've ever experienced in my life. I've watched every episode probably four or five times because it's just so fun to go back in there. I think what Disney hasn't really planned for is, you know, that release cycle, that compulsive need for new content like The Mandalorian at that quality bar. They have a lot that they can go to and lean on, but they need to amp up the production release schedule. And I don't know if movies are gonna be the thing that, you know, keeps us coming back as much as weekly shows do. You know, because you watch a two hour movie, great, you took that in. We watched Onward on Disney Plus a little while ago, and it was great, but it's not like we're gonna go back and rewatch Onward four or five times. You know, I think that these shows are incredibly important and 50 million subscribers is a massive number and I'm sure part of it is because of the pandemic, but it's up to Disney now to say, look, we have these characters, we have these properties, we need to make a lot of new programming. Animated stuff for sure, but we need to make a lot of live action stuff around some of these properties. <laughs> Google wants to make it easier to play games during the quarantine and promote their new service in the process. The game streaming platform Stadia is free for the next two months. You'll still have to buy most of the actual games, but there are nine free titles, including the racing game Grid and Bungie's online shooter Destiny 2. In order to get in, you'll need to sign up for a Stadia Pro account and put in your credit card information, but you won't be charged for the first two months, and you can opt out before the free trial period is over. Stadia president Phil Harrison says they're doing this to make self-isolation less difficult, although it's also worth pointing out that Stadia has struggled to win over new subscribers. I think Stadia is still building, uh, you, you know, what its potential could be. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. The technology kind of works and I, it sucks that they launched it and it was a beta. It was sort of not ready for prime time and people signed up and wanted all of the features that have been touted, you know, all of these things that Phil Harrison has gone up on stage and talked about that we're going to be a part of what Stadia is. And we've still been waiting for a lot of those features. If there was ever going to be a time period where they should be screeching forward, it's right now. This should be the period where Stadia is amping up its promotion and saying, look, you know, you're waiting for these next gen machines, but we've got a system that's capable of running 4K content and it's available right now with ray tracing and all the stuff that they should be able to target and hit with their streaming service, but they're not quite there yet. They're still sort of catching up to what they were promising last year. Because I do believe that there are a lot of customers out there that don't want another 
you know, machine in front of their machines. They are, or they aren't even into the idea of having a video game console. And most of their life is about streaming subscriptions. That's what, you know, most con entertainment consumers, that's what they're doing these days. They're, they've got Netflix accounts and now Disney Plus accounts. And so that mindset is there. And there's a reason why Google has said, look, this is going to be the future. The challenge that I think Stadia has always had is that they have no alternative other than to stream. Whereas Xbox definitely has a bunch of different ways for people to play and Sony has a bunch of different ways to play. Apple Arcade has a bunch of ways for people to play. But Stadia, you have to have the bandwidth and you have to stream. And all of the reporting on this technology has been in contention or cross-examined against local content being sent to a television set and it's not quite a fair comparison. It's not going to be as good as an HDMI cable going into your TV. What I have played of Stadia has actually been pretty damn impressive. It's been pretty damn cool to boot up a game as massive as NBA 2K20 is very quickly and jump into play, you know, a quick game of basketball whereas opposed to it's sitting on my hard drive on my PlayStation 4 which understandably it looks much better, but I have to clear space on the hard drive in order to have it there. I have to update it every single time. It has to update with new rosters and all that stuff. In Stadia, it doesn't have to do any of that stuff. You turn it on and poof, and in two minutes you're playing the game. And that is exciting for me. But yeah, I want to hear your thoughts on Stadia. So let me know in the comments below. With Stadia, we can all dream bigger and together build a playground for every imagination. That's going to do it for our rundown today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow with a brand new episode for you. But in the meantime, we've got lots of other fresh content for you to take a look at. So please do that. And if you dig our channel, hit that subscribe button. If you like this video, hit that like button. Thanks for sharing. We will see you tomorrow. And until then, play forever.